The Grand Prix car, like a fighter aircraft, represents the pinnacle of the technology of its time and that of the country of origin. For a decade following the Second World War, Italian cars were supreme. The Alfa Romeo 158, whose straight-eight supercharged engine made it for a time unbeatable. The post-war years are now seen as a classic era, dominated by the blood-red cars of Italy, Alfa Romeo, Maserati, and a newcomer, Ferrari. From 1946, Italian racing cars, alive with nervous power, burst onto the tracks of Europe as if the war had never occurred. It is said that motor racing took place in southern Italy even as the war raged on in the north. The first official races took place in France, in Paris and at Nice. No one cared to question from where the fuel, tyres and, in certain cases, the cars themselves came from. The field included a 1925 Amon car. At Nice, the Italian Villoresi won on a Maserati. In England, too, cars were being disinterred from garage and barn, having survived bombs and wartime scrap drives. It had been hoped to run a victory race round Hyde Park, but the police had objected. The best that could be organised was a sprint meeting on Elstree Airfield. With pre-war English drivers like John Bolster and journalist Dennis Jenkinson competing, as did Lightweight, a car designed and built to test certain theories about rubber suspension. Its designer's later cars were to be better known, the Morris Minor and the Mini. Lightweight's young driver is Alec Isigonis. The reason for British drivers being reduced to an airfield was simple. Public roads in England could not by law be closed for motor racing. Before the war, racing had been at Brooklands, where the official motto was, the right crowd and no crowding. The racing was almost incidental. During the war, Vickers had built bombers at Brooklands, and the track had been camouflaged and built upon, not only by fake houses, but solid buildings. And as a contemporary newsreel put it, No, I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Brooklands has had it. As had Donington, where the cars of Hitler's Germany had thrilled the crowds before the war. So if in 1946 you wished to see the works team of 158 Alfa Romeos in action, you had to journey to the continent, in this case to Geneva, for what was the first post-war Grand Prix to Formula One. One and a half litre supercharged, four and a half litre unsupercharged. The Alphas outclass all other cars, taking first, second and third places. Nina Farina driving the winning car with Jean-Pierre Vimy second. Farina would enjoy many victories at the wheel of an Alpha 158, which had first appeared in 1938 to compete in voiturette races, equivalent to today's Formula 2. The cars had spent the war years walled up in a cheese factory. Now they are eligible for the new Formula 1. But who, apart from Farina, to drive them? Vimy died practicing at Buenos Aires. Achille Varzi made a fatal mistake at Bern. Tazio Nuvolari to this day, considered by many to be the greatest driver of all time, was seriously ill, poisoned by years of breathing exhaust gas and corrosive fuels. Though developing a new car, he had driven in his last Grand Prix. A new generation takes over, one of whom is an Argentinian mechanic, Juan Manuel Fangio, El Chueco, the bowling one. Admirers from his hometown of Barcarce have given him a 4CLT Maserati, with which he wins at San Remo, Po and Perpignan. And though 38, he is signed by Alfa Romeo. By 1948, the lack of a racing circuit in Britain appeared to have been resolved. The RAC had visited many of the hundreds of abandoned wartime airfields attracted by the perimeter tracks and long runways. Also, most were isolated from articulate objectors to noise. One was leased. Its name, Silverstone. The first meeting there was in September for Formula 3, 
and followed by a Grand Prix to the new Formula One. Italian and French cars dominated, the best British cars being the supercharged ERAs. ERA, English Racing Automobiles, had first appeared in 1934 as voiturettes waiting on the sidelines for the real Grand Prix. Raymond May's centre was the father of the project, and pre-war ERAs had been very successful. But at Solveston in 1948, they are outclassed by more modern continental cars, a travelling marshal on a Norton. There were no alphas at this meeting, which was won by Luigi Villarese driving a Maserati. Another Italian, Alberto Ascari, was second on a similar car, and an ERA third. In September 1948, another airfield, West Hampton, renamed Goodwood, was open for racing. ERAs, driven with varying degrees of competence, competed. Yet, despite their archaic appearance, even then they went surprisingly well. John Watson tests an ERA, appropriately on a disused airfield. It sums up for me what a racing engine should feel like and sound like, and it's just so eager and willing wants to rev. I mean, it's lovely. I mean, it's so much fun. You're really sitting quite high on the car. It's a solid axle front and rear. The ride is very, very bouncy. Although the handling and road holding is not bad, it's just that you're driving along and I don't know what bounces more, the car or the driver. And there's nothing to hold you in. There's no seat belts. I think those drivers were different to the current Grand Prix driver. They weren't any better, but certainly it was, it was a different form of racing. You couldn't drive a Grand Prix in those days as you would drive it today. In the early post-war years, 16 surviving ERAs were the only Grand Prix cars available to most British drivers. Heaven help them. I mean, the engine in the car, the engine in the ERA is absolutely fantastic. There's just something about the noise, the way it responds to the throttle. It, it, it sounds and feels like a real racing engine. But the suspension of the pre-war car is something that uh, I have to take off my metaphorical hat because it's uh, beyond my conception how anybody or how the guys that raced them, even you know, in the early post-war years, were so successful. <laughs> And strong too, neither Jeff Ansell nor his ERA being seriously damaged. ERAs were eligible for Formula One races, though outclassed by Italian cars, in particular the Alpha 158s. The Alpha had been designed in 1938 by Colombo, who, like many Italian engineers, seemed able to turn artifact into art. The whole car was beautifully constructed. The one and a half litre straight eight supercharged engine produced 380 horsepower at the cost of horrendous fuel consumption, one and a half miles per gallon. But in the late 40s, the Alpha was the car to beat.